remember the good old days when white people hated black culture they thought black culture was inferior they would say things like jazz and blues were rudimentary music and they detested the way that we dressed and wore our hair those were the days I'm not even going to get into the relationship between integration and the normalization of cultural appropriation because I think that's pretty obvious and I think there are less obvious consequences of integration which we are going to get into but first let's get into some history. The unfortunate reality of the integration movement in the US of the 50s and 60s is that it did not lead into actual integration. It just led to desegregation. Integration would have been deconstructing the current system which was based on anti-black violence and rebuilding a new one for the successful coexistence of blacks and whites. What happened was desegregation. They simply plucked black people out of our own schools, neighborhoods, businesses, and placed us into white ones where we were subjected to white violence with little to no protection. After the 1954 U.S. Supreme Court ruled to desegregate all schools in the nation, nine black American students were chosen to attend Little Rock Central High School, an all-white school. For the entire school year, these nine black students were escorted by army troops. However, the presence of the troops didn't prevent them from experiencing violence. Melba was kicked, beaten, and had acid thrown in her face. Gloria was pushed down a flight of stairs, and the Little Rock Nine were barred from participating in extracurricular activities. Does that sound like actual integration to you? Again, these students were only escorted for one school year, so imagine how bad it was after their protection left. A large problem with government mandated desegregation is that it didn't allow for authentic cultural and social change to take place. It just made racists have to become more sneaky and creative with their racism so that they wouldn't get in trouble with the law. And this is why I believe that when the US Supreme Court found that separate was not actually equal, instead of mandating desegregation, they should have just enforced separate but actually equal. The problem was that black schools were not receiving the same funding and resources as white schools, thus leading to a lower quality of education for black students. So to me, the obvious solution is just give the black schools the proper funding, not force black students to leave their own institutions to be victims of racial violence at white institutions. Moreover, I believe the Supreme Court's decision to desegregate schools plays into the black inferiority myth. We all know that the reason why the black schools were unequal to the white schools was because they were under-resourced and underfunded. But the fact that the US Supreme Court decided to remedy this problem by forcing black students to attend white schools suggests that the only reason why the black schools were unequal was because they were black. It suggests that the only way a black student can receive the proper education is in a white institution. And that's racist. That's racist! And this is why in 2021, we're still having conversations about how classist and racist standardized testing is. It's why so many black people are just now learning about the Tulsa race massacre and Black Wall Street. This is why so many of us were never taught about our own efforts in the black community to build our own because the US education system was never built or rebuilt with anyone in mind other than white people. Now we're gonna get into the integration of media and how this has led to the overrepresentation or the overdominance of the white gaze in black media. So let's start with the white gaze. I first learned about the white gaze from Toni Morrison. She described it as the little white man that sits on your shoulder and checks out everything you do or say. You sort of knock them off and you're free. Essentially, the white gaze is when black creators, whether they're painters, writers, movie directors, whatever, they create their art with white people at the center or white people as their target audience. The lack of white gaze in Toni Morrison's writings was a source of controversy for her. Many critics of her work would say that she's such a brilliant writer, it's a shame she doesn't take in consideration a white audience. She doesn't take in consideration a white perspective or a white point of view. I remember a review of Sula in which the reviewer said, this is all well and good, but one day she, meaning me, will have to face up 
to the real responsibilities and get mature and write about the real uh, confrontation for black people, which is white people. As though our lives have no meaning and no depth without the white gaze. Not only did Toni Morrison write about black people, she wrote for black people. And there were many critics of her who felt that she was holding herself back by not considering a white audience. Because when black creators appeal to a white audience, their work becomes more mainstream, more popular. One way you can tell a black creator is centering the white gaze in their work is if they are explaining certain things they wouldn't have to explain to a black person. A perfect example of this is Blackish. In literally every episode of Blackish, it begins with Dre, played by Anthony Anderson, explaining some sort of black phenomenon, whether it's Juneteenth, the nod, cultural appropriation, whatever. Dre explains the black phenomenon to his largely non black audience. Only 20% of those who watch Blackish are actually black. So, really, Blackish episodes are about 20 minute lighthearted lessons to non-black people about the black experience. Another example of the white gaze in black art would be Lena Waithe and Queen and Slim. Every black person knew what the end of that film was before we had even seen it. And we knew because we've all heard that story before, we've all seen that story before. I actually went into the theater to watch that movie hoping that the plot twist would be that everything would be okay. So one would ask, why would Lena make a movie that is so predictable? her audience? Well the answer is well, we weren't her audience. Queen and Slim was Lena's attempt to appeal to the humanity of non-black people. It was her romanticized attempt to get non-black people to understand our humanity and to understand the nature of our relationship with the police. Black people we did not need this lesson. We know our humanity and we understand our history with the police state. Moreover, if we wanted to just consume black trauma for the sake of consuming black trauma, we literally could have just pulled up Alton Sterling's Wikipedia page, you know what I mean? This movie literally wasn't for us, it was for the whites and the whites ate it up. Queen and Slim has an 88% Rotten Tomato score, I would personally give it about a 40 and that's just for the aesthetics of the film and the fire soundtrack. And of course I'm not saying that there are no black people who like that movie, I just know most did some may say that there is a place for media like Blackish and Queen and Slim um, where it's black people trying to teach the black experience to non-black people. Um, I disagree. I just feel like if Roots couldn't change white folks' minds, there's really nothing that Kenya Barra's Lena Waithe or any black creator could make to make white people get it. I don't think it's our responsibility to make white people get it. Secondly, the white gaze is absolutely overrepresented in black TV shows and film. Like everything is a lesson directed to non-black people. We have very few TV shows and movies that are not only by us, but actually for us. Creating a TV show for black people and allowing the opportunity for non-black people to learn from it is very different from creating a show about black people for the consumption of non-blacks because the latter makes a spectacle out of black people. And ultimately, it neglects who I believe should be your target audience if you're making black art. And I think this is what separates newer shows like Blackish from older shows like The Cosby Show. And I wholeheartedly believe that this overrepresentation of the white gaze in black media is due to integration. Because instead of uplifting black TV shows and movies as they existed, these creators were pressured to conform their work to a white audience in order for it to be successful. And I'm tired of it. I'm so tired. I'm so tired of black creators trying to appeal to non-black people. You cannot appeal to the moral sense of the immoral. Now we're going to get into how integration of the TV industry has led to the lack of representation for dark black people and the overrepresentation of light and mixed race black people. We are going to do this by briefly analyzing the most popular black family TV sitcoms of the past five to six decades. I chose each show based on which shows had the highest ratings and viewership at the time they were airing. Going back to the 1970s, the most popular black family sitcom was Good Times. Let's take a look at the cast. Taking a look at the cast, not a biracial in sight. And there is only one person I would personally describe as light skin and that would be homeboy with a colorful shirt. 
And then for the 80s, we have The Cosby Show. We have two visibly biracial girls, Denise and Sandra, and I'm not mad at that. I think in the Huxable family, we really get to see how diverse the Black American family can look. More importantly, the ratio of biracials to monoracials is still in favor of monoracials. The monoracials are dominating, and we have, in my opinion, adequate dark skin representation. And then for the 90s, we have the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Similar to The Cosby Show, once again, the two daughters are played by visibly biracial black girls. If you didn't already know, Tatiana Ali is black. Well, her mom is um, Afro-Latina and her father is Indian. And then Hillary, what's her name, Karen Parsons? She's black and white. And both of them self-identify as biracial. In terms of dark skin representation, it's definitely subpar. Of course, we had our OG Aunt Viv, our dark skin queen, who was replaced by a light skin Aunt Viv. So for a minute, it really was just Jeffrey. Again, personally, I'm not mad at the biracial to monoracial ratio because the monoracials are still dominating, but I am starting to wonder why the girls of Black American families continue to be represented by biracials. Additionally, the cast definitely lacks dark skin representation after the departure of OG Aunt Viv, and the cast is definitely overrepresented by light and medium tone folk. And then for the 2000s, we have My Wife and Kids. I could have swore Junior was darker than that, whatever. Anyway, are we going to say Junior's dark skin? I don't know. I don't know because I feel like if Junior's dark skin, then we have to say Michael's dark skin because they're literally right, they're right there. Either way, once again, the two daughters I played by biracial daughters and we have another light skin wife. They did have a dark skin Claire at the beginning, but just like OG on Viv, she was replaced by a light bright. And then for the 2010s, we have Blackish. Guys, this is bad. The actors that play Jack, Junior, Baby Devante, Bo, and Zoe are all biracial, putting it at a 5 biracials to 4 monoracials ratio. The biracials are officially dominating. I also think it's worth noting that the darkest member of the cast plays the evil maniacal little girl, but let me refocus. Again, we're only looking at the most popular black family sitcom of each decade. But in the 90s, we had Moesha, right? Like the entire family was darker than a brown bag. I think in 2021, that would literally never happen. An entire family that's darker than a brown bag, that would literally never happen. But even then in the 90s, it wasn't as popular as other black family sitcoms like The Fresh Prince or even Sister Sister. And then in the 2010s, we had The Carmichael Show, which had a much more diverse cast in terms of skin tone, but it still was not as popular as Blackish. Coincidence? I think not! Now to bring this back to integration. For most of TV history, Black people have not been able to tell our own stories. In the early days of TV, Black actors were limited to playing Black stereotypes, like the Mammy, the Infantile Negro, the Jezebel, and so on. After segregation was deemed unconstitutional, we slowly began to see black actors and TV shows begin to be taken more seriously because TV stations were being pressured to integrate. However, all of the most popular black TV shows have been on white TV stations with white producers, white directors, and in many cases, white writers. Moreover, it is well documented how the FCC, which is the Federal Communications Commission, I think, I don't know, Basically, the FCC is responsible for regulating TV, radio, cable, and all that in the United States. But it's been well documented how the FCC has suppressed Black TV broadcast ownership. So in most cases, we have had white people telling Black stories. And I'm not gonna lie, for a minute it was cool. In the 90s, up-and-coming TV stations such as Fox, UPN, the WB, found it profitable to create black TV shows with black leads telling black stories. According to TV critic Eric Degen, these networks would get their early audience with these shows and then slowly start to focus their broadcast networks away from black viewers because they wanted the greater advertising dollars that came from shows that appealed to white viewers. So once these TV shows, which got their start by creating black TV shows and catering to a black audience, once they realized that they can make even more money by appealing to a white audience, they not only began to decrease the number of black TV shows they were airing, but they also began to change the way that these black TV shows looked. 
often choosing light mix and sometimes ambiguous actors to play black characters. And this is absolutely carried on to today. Literally look at any recently developed TV show and look at how they choose to represent black people. And I am blaming this on integration because I wholeheartedly believe that if we had black TV stations in the early days of TV that had the proper funding and resources and governmental protections and support, we would not be where we are today. TV would not look like what it looks like today because we would have been able to create and protect our own narratives instead of having to rely on white stations to see the value in telling our stories. To summarize, the U.S. integration movement can be seen as a failure for three reasons. One, true integration did not occur. We did not integrate. We were violently absorbed. Black people were simply removed from our own schools, churches, businesses, and neighborhoods and placed into white ones with little to no protection. Two, integration has led to the overrepresentation of the white gaze in all forms of black media, leading to changes in how black stories are told and how black people are represented. Three, integration never allowed the opportunity for black Americans to build our own with proper governmental support and protection. Not only were we never given a fair chance to build our own, we were also never taught about our attempts to build our own and how they were squandered by white people. I believe that integration or desegregation or whatever you want to call it has created a sort of psychological dependence among black Americans for white validation. And I know I focus a lot of this video on talking about TV shows and books and movies, but I really think this applies to all areas of the Black experience. We are so cognizant of the white gaze in our daily lives. Like at the workplace, we're worried about being seen as the difficult one. At the grocery store, we're worried about someone will think we're stealing. Um, if we're the only black person at an event, we feel pressured to represent the entire race. But Toni Morrison, posed a question. I know, again, Toni Morrison. Yeah, damn Toni Morrison. But I'm just gonna reword it a little bit. What happens to the imagination of a black person who is at some level always conscious of representing their race to, or in spite of, a race of people that understands itself to be universal? What happens? Answer in the comments below.